The vertebral column, commonly known as the spine or backbone, provides essential structural support for maintaining an upright posture and enabling flexible motion. It is composed of 33 to 35 vertebrae, with 24 interconnected by cartilaginous intervertebral discs. The spine extends from the base of the skull to the tip of the coccyx and is divided into five regions, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. The vertebrae in the cervical, thoracic and lumbar regions are separated by intervertebral discs, while the sacral and coccygeal vertebrae are fused. Regions of the vertebral column. We'll start superiorly and work our way inferiorly. Cervical region consists of seven vertebrae in the neck, articulating superiorly with the occipital bone of the skull at the occipital joint and inferiorly with the first thoracic vertebra. Thoracic region, the longest segment, with 12 vertebrae, articulating superiorly with the seventh cervical vertebra and inferiorly with the first lumbar vertebra. Each thoracic vertebra articulates with the ribs of the thoracic wall. Lumbar region, comprises five vertebrae located inferior to the rib cage and superior to the pelvis and sacrum. These are the largest vertebrae, primarily bearing the weight of the upper body. They articulate superiorly with the twelfth thoracic vertebra and inferiorly with the first sacral vertebra at the lumbosacral joint. Sacral region, formed by five fused vertebrae, linking the spine to the iliac bones and playing a crucial role in hip stability. It articulates superiorly with the fifth lumbar vertebra and inferiorly with the coccyx and also with the iliac bones. Coccygeal region, the most inferior part, composed of three to five fused vertebrae forming the coccyx or tailbone. The coccyx articulates with the apex of the sacrum. Now that we have a general understanding of the structure and regions of the spine, let's examine the characteristics of a typical vertebra in more detail. Most vertebrae share a basic structure consisting of a vertebral body, vertebral arch, and seven processes. Although sacral and coccygeal vertebrae are fused, this structure is applicable to the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar regions. Vertebral body is the front part and it is a weight-bearing structure. The size increases as the column descends, making lumbar vertebral bodies larger than cervical ones. The bodies are separated by intervertebral discs and contain costal facets unique to the thoracic vertebrae. The vertebral arch is located posterior to the body and is formed by two pedicles and two laminae. The pedicles have superior and inferior vertebral notches that form intervertebral foramina. The laminae connect the spinous processes to the transverse processes and form the posterolateral walls of the foramina. Vertebral processes these include one spinous process, two transverse processes, and four articular processes. These processes serve as attachment points for ligaments and muscles and participate in joint formation. Spinous process protrudes posteriorly from the junction of the laminae and may vary in size and shape from region to region. They serve as attachment points for muscles and ligaments. Transverse processes project laterally from the vertebral arch. They function as attachment points for muscles and ligaments for back and neck movement. Their size and structure vary in different regions. Articular processes, two superior and two inferior processes facilitating articulation with adjacent vertebrae at the zygopophy seal joints. Vertebral foramen, a central opening formed by the vertebral body and vertebral arch. The vertebral foramina form the vertebral canal, which houses the spinal cord. The size of the foramina decreases as the column descends and the shape also varies, with triangular in cervical and lumbar and round or oval in the thoracic region. Now that we've explored the structure and characteristics of vertebrae, let's look at spinal curvatures. The spine has four curvatures, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. Primary curvatures, thoracic and sacral curvatures are concave anteriorly and termed as kyphosis. They result from the flexed fetal position. Thoracic kyphosis extends from T2 T11 or T12 with a normal angle range from 20 to 50 degrees. Sacral kyphosis, also called the pelvic curve, extends from the lumbosacral junction to the apex of the coccyx. Secondary curvatures, cervical and lumbar curvatures that appear in the later fetal period and are concave posteriorly and termed as lordosis.
they develop due to the thickness of the intervertebral discs. Cervical lordosis appears when the infant starts holding its head and extends from the dens axis to the second thoracic vertebra. Lumbar lordosis develops when a child begins to sit and walk, extending from T12 to the lumbosacral joint. The vertebral column allows for movements of flexion, extension, lateral flexion, and rotation. These movements are facilitated by the back muscles and aided by gravity and the action of the abdominal muscles. The curvatures of the spine and the intervertebral discs provide flexibility and resilience to axial compressive forces. The vertebral column also protects the spinal cord. That's a lot of information on the vertebral column. Let's work on consolidating that knowledge by applying it to a clinical scenario. Abnormal curvatures. As we have seen, the spinal column is not a straight structure, but rather has four curves that function to provide flexible support and to facilitate movement. Abnormal curvatures of the spinal column can also occur and are often the result of developmental abnormalities or as a result of pathological processes. We detect hyperkyphosis, hyperlordosis and scoliosis. Hyperkyphosis, an abnormal increase in thoracic curvature causing a hunchback, often due to osteoporosis, muscular weakening, or aging. A kyphosis angle greater than 50 degrees is indicative of hyperkyphosis. Hyperlordosis, an abnormal increase in lumbar curvature, often associated with weakened trunk muscles, obesity, or pregnancy. A lordosis angle greater than 40 degrees is indicative of hyperlordosis. Scoliosis, characterized by an abnormal lateral curvature accompanied by vertebral rotation. Causes include asymmetrical muscle weakness, malformation of vertebrae, or differences in limb length. Treatments for abnormal curvatures. Treatment varies based on the cause and may include physical therapy, surgical fusion, bracing, weight loss and exercise. Understanding the structure, regions, curvatures, and functions of the vertebral column is essential for students of anatomy. This structure facilitates movement, provides support, and protects the spinal cord. Furthermore, it is important to be aware of abnormal curvatures and the appropriate clinical treatments. Well, we've made it to the end of this part. But let's take some time to review what we've learned today before you rush off. We began with a general overview of the regions of the spine. Here we explored the general structure of the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal regions of the spine. We then examined the structural features of a typical vertebra, which include the vertebral body, vertebral arch, and vertebral foramen. We also identified the components of the vertebral arch, including the pedicle, lamini, and seven processes. The seven processes of the vertebral arch include the spinous process, the two transverse processes, the two superior articular processes, and the two inferior articular processes. We then examined the spine as a whole and evaluated its curvatures. We examined the primary and secondary curvatures of the spine. Primary curvatures include thoracic and sacral kyphosis, which occur during embryonic development. Secondary curves include cervical and lumbar lordosis, which form in the later stages of fetal development. Next, we will examine the movements and functions of the spine. Movements of the spine include flexion, extension, lateral flexion, and rotation. These movements are facilitated by the muscles and ligaments of the back and the anterolateral abdominal wall muscles. In addition to facilitating movement, the spine also serves to house and protect the spinal cord. To conclude today's tutorial, we examined the effects of abnormal curvatures of the spine. We explored the causes, diagnosis, and treatment of hyperkyphosis, hyperlordosis, and scoliosis. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed learning about the spine. So don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next parts and give a like.